and turn to the book of Genesis, the second chapter of the book of Genesis. I want to read the first three verses and then verse 15. This is Labor Day weekend. I want to preach this morning a simple message on the blessing and dignity of work. Genesis chapter 2, beginning. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to till it, to work there and to keep it. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning. We lift our pastor up to you there in Houston. We pray, God, that you will bless him, use him mightily as you always do. And here in this place and on all of those who are part of this viewing experience this morning, I pray that you will bless us, open our hearts and minds to your word in the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow's Labor Day. Many of us will have the day off from work. It's a day when the United States celebrates the honor of, of labor. However, we have always sort of experienced a love-hate relationship with work. In, uh, in My Fair Lady, Liza Doolittle's father, Alfred P. Doolittle, sings these words. The Lord gave man an arm of iron. So he could do his job and never shirk. But with a little bit of luck, someone else will do the blinking work. In 1928, a guy called, that called himself his singing ver, ver, uh, name was Haywire Mack. His real name was Harry McClintock. Recorded a kind of anthem to the hobo lifestyle called the Big Rock Candy Mountain. I won't uh, read all of it to you. Some of it <laughs> you don't want to read in church. But here's some of it that's a little bit sanitized. In the Big Rock Candy Mountains, you never change your socks. And the little streams of alcohol come trickling down the rocks. There's a lake of stew and of whiskey too. You can paddle all around them in a big canoe. The jails are made of tin. You can walk right out as, again as soon as you are in. There ain't no short handled shovels, no axes, saws, or picks. I'm bound to stay where you sleep all day, where they hung the jerk that invented work in the Big Rock Candy Mountain. <laughs> where they hung the jerk that invented work. Now here's the problem. As funny as that sounds, the jerk that invented work is God Almighty. <laughs> we must understand that work is not part of the curse of the fall. Many people think that somehow or another in the Garden of Eden that humanity would have just floated around, maybe slept all day, just like the, it was kind of the, the biblical version of the Big Rock Candy Mountain. And that when Adam and Eve fell, that as a result of that, we had to go to work. That is not true at all. Actually, we were called and commissioned to work in the Garden of Eden. It's not because of the fall. Now, our struggle because of the fall is a struggle with, the, with nature. Nature also fell. We struggle in the natural realm. The thorns and the thistles are become sort of a, a, um, a metaphor of the struggle to produce work in a fallen world. But work is not part of the fall. Adam was called to be a gardener, and it's a dignified and blessed work. Work is godly because it is godlike. The first place that work is mentioned in the Bible is God. In the few verses which we read this morning, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it mentions God working three times. If God is a worker and God works, then how much greater for us to be as godly as possible when we work, we are doing the kinds of things that God himself did. God is creative in his work. God did it well. God did it well, not half-heartedly. I'm so glad that God didn't just walk out onto the edge of the abyss and say, well, let's get this over with. We'll do that. We'll make something, I don't know what. How about dirt? And dirt just floating around loose in the universe. And you say, all right, I don't know, roses and light. There, that's good enough. 
Aren't you glad that God was creative and disciplined, that he had a plan, that he was orderly? He didn't do it halfway. God was diligent. There are two different kinds of workers. There are those who ask themselves, is that good enough? And there are those who ask themselves, is that the best that I can do? That's what God analyzed, his every stage of the plan of creation. And he said, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And when he came to the end of it, he said, now that's very good. That is the kind of worker that we are called to be. Work is not demeaning. No job that you have, I don't care if it's cleaning toilets at the Atlanta airport. No job can be demeaning to you unless you allow it to be demeaning to you. I, I know what, what somebody's thinking. Yeah, that's fine. You're, you know, a big shot preacher on the platform with a suit and tie on. You don't know what I deal with. Listen, I want to tell you something. Preachers in their 60s do not spring full grown from the forehead of Zeus. Do you realize there is a life behind this decrepit old body? There were times, I, my jobs over the years have included uh, cleaning apartments. I wonder if any of you have ever cleaned apartments after renters have moved out. Listen, I've been in touch with humanity at its lowest level. I have mowed grass for a living. I have bagged groceries. I bagged groceries at an all-night grocery store in downtown Washington, D.C., and I hitchhiked down to Washington and back to the University of Maryland, and I hitchhiked all over. I was in the 70s. How'd you like that opening number this morning with the lights and everything? I thought, man, what we need is a big round ball to send right here, be swirling around, and we could do some moves. Oh, you think Dr. Mark can't do it. I'll give you some moonwalk. Oh. But I was the long-haired college kid standing out beside of the road, hitchhiking my way to work and hitchhiking my way home. There's a lot of work that went into getting to this place. Work is not demeaning. Work is an opportunity from God to be creative, to be diligent, and to be like him. Work is a gift from God. Secondly, there are benefits of work. There's the sense of satisfaction, the sense of accomplishment. If I could only just say to, to folks that are working at, at, at hard work, at manual work, when you've finished cleaning that bathroom, if you, could, if you could just step back for a moment, instead of saying, thank God that's over, if you could just step back for a moment and say, now, that's done well. It's ready for the next customer. <laughs> there is a sense of satisfaction. I was um, walking past uh, um, some bricklayers that were working in Florida one time, and just as I passed, right at the moment I passed, the boss said to everybody, all right, step back, step back. Right as I passed, step back. And everybody kind of stood up. They were, they were dirty. They were tired. It was hot. They were sweating. And he said, all right, look at what we've done. I was walking on the sidewalk right past. He said, now look at what we've done. He said, that's what you've accomplished. And I stopped. I said to him, I said, that is leadership, my friend. I love hearing you say that. He said, listen, we have worked on this thing for weeks. And he said, I want my crew to see what they have accomplished. Work can give you a sense of accomplishment. It gives you a way to witness it gives you a way to, to show what loyalty and gratitude. I, I've got a word I want to say to the laboring folks who work for some company or another. If you talk about how stupid your boss is and how stupid the company is, listen, do you realize that every time you lower your boss, you lower yourself? What everybody, you say, oh, my boss is so stupid. You realize what everybody else is thinking? <laughs> If he's that stupid and he's here, then you're down here. You see, if, if, if he's stupid, he hired you. You understand? But if you will exalt your company, oh, I work for the greatest company in the world. I work for the greatest boss in the world. He's so smart. She's so discerning. She's so wise. 
Of course she is. She hired me. It gives you a chance to, to prove loyalty, gratitude, and Christianity in your work. Years ago, I applied for a job. I was driving a school bus. I drove a 60-passenger school bus in downtown Washington, D.C. If you need any other proof that everybody in Washington is completely insane, drive a school bus in that city. It will, it will convince you. And uh, one day, I came back past the principal's office just as I heard him say. It was, it was a fairly small school, uh, a private school. I was just driving the bus. I'd go drive the bus, park it, go to my early class, and then come back in the afternoon, drive the kids home. And just as I passed the principal's office, I heard him say, oh, no, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he hung the phone up, and I said, Mr. Selden, what's the problem? And he said, our English teacher has just been injured in a skiing accident and is going to miss the whole year. And school starts in about three days after the fall break. And he said, I have no way of getting an English teacher. I said, you know, I happen to be wonderful at English. I said, you can't believe how well I could teach English. And he said, all right, you're hired. I said, you know, I'm not certified. I don't have a college degree. I'm a junior in college. He said, you're hired. He said, we'll just float it past. He said, you're hired. I said, now, Mr. Selden, there's one other thing you need to know. I'm a Christian. I just want to make that clear to you. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to make a big deal of it in the classroom, but I'm not going to apologize. I'm a Christian. I'm preparing for the ministry. He said, you're doubly hired. I said, well, that's great. I, I didn't know you were a Christian. He said, oh, I'm not a Christian. He said, I'm not a Christian. I'm not going to be a Christian. But he said, I love to hire Christians. They don't show up drunk. They don't lay out on me. And they don't get drunk and have accidents in, in Europe. <laughs> Work is a means for you to give God the glory. Work is a means for you to provide for others. Work is a means for you to provide for your family. You, you may not provide for your family as, as some at, uh, at some levels, but, it, but you provide for your family with dignity. that they can, You can say to them, this is what the labor of my hands has provided. The food that you eat is because I worked, not because I depend upon somebody else to give it to us. I, I, listen, I want to make this clear. Listen to me, I want to make this clear. I don't want to be condescending about this. I know that there are times when in any family, any situation can hit such a, a moment of hardship that you need help. I, 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 I'm not judging that. But what I am saying is this. As soon as you possibly can, by the grace of God, at the level that you can arrive at, when you can work your way out of that and, and pry yourself out of this dependence on governmental agencies and find the dignity of providing for your own family, God will bless you. God will bless you in it. It's not only a means for you to, to provide for your own family, it is a means means for you to become a participant in the kingdom of God. This is the wonderful thing about tithing. Now listen to this. If you make $100 a week and tithe, and Donald Trump tithes, oh, oh, please God. And <laughs> if you make $100 a week and tithe, and a multimillionaire tithes, do you realize you both give exactly the same thing in God's eyes? You give the same thing in God's eyes. So when, you, when you're working, when you're, when you're laboring with your hands, whatever your job is, it allows you to become a, an authentic participant in the, greater, in the greater work of the kingdom. It also is a means of service. When I was the president at Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, there's a wonderful little lady that worked in our housekeeping crew. And one day, as, as I just passed her, I stopped to chat for a while. She lived in a little tiny house right off campus. I'd taken her home in my car a few times. She was an elderly lady, and I just loved her sweetheart of an old lady. And I said to her one time, I said, I know cleaning up after these college kids. Listen, I don't know how many of you have been in a boy's dormitory, but it's an experience. Really, it is. You worry, you worry that these people are not completely human. 
And I, I said, I know that sometimes it must be discouraging to you to, to clean these dormitories and clean these rooms and, and clean all, all this and for these college kids. I, I know it must wear on you. She looked at me like I was talking Russian. She said, Dr. Utland, this is the honor of my life. I said, really? She said, I never graduated from high school. I've never had a job that didn't pay minimum salary. I'm never going to. She said, I'm in my late 70s, and I'm going to work till I drop. And she said, I'm never going to have a high-paid job. I barely hold my life together. But she said, what I can do when I walk into a room and clean that room, when I clean that bathroom, when I clean that hallway, I realize I'm never, ever going to invent the cure for cancer. But I may be cleaning the room for the girl that will invent it. Wow. Now, work also can be the instrument of God to free us from living in financial sins. Overspending, living in credit card bondage, gambling. I, I, I want to say something to you here. The lottery, the lottery could not exist would go out of business if it weren't for the poor. The poor are often deprived of lunch money. I, I, I know this is going to be controversial here, but you know what? I ain't running for nothing in Georgia. <laughs> so here it is. If it weren't for poor families that are just hoping maybe, maybe this ticket will get us up to another level. Maybe this ticket will get us up. If it weren't for the poor that were sometimes spending the lunch money of their children to buy lottery tickets, the lottery would go out of existence. Now, I just want to say something to you. I urge you, work hard, work for a living, use your money well, and I'm urging you not to spend your money on something like gambling. I believe that it is contrary to God's will and purpose. And I don't believe it would hurt my heart or the hurt heart of God if the lottery did go out of business. It also, by work, it gives you a sense of purpose and vision that transcends, takes you beyond the bondage of envy. Envy is always a, a mechanism that works from less to more. In other words, you will never find a man driving a Mercedes Benz standing there, watch someone else drive by in a dilapidated old Cavalier and say, look at that. They just think they're poorer than everybody. <laughs> I wish I could drive that car. It always works the other way. Envy always envies someone that that you think has more, doesn't deserve it, ought not to have it, something that you ought to have. But envy becomes a bottomless pit and a bondage that, that will separate you from your own capacity and dream. Senator Phil Graham became the senior senator from the state of Texas. A brilliant, brilliant United States senator who became the head of the Senate Banking Committee and has gone down in history as the most educated, most articulate understander uh, with the greatest understanding of the banking system in the United States. He taught economics and finance at Texas A&M, but he was actually raised right here in the state of Georgia, down in Columbus. He was raised by a single mom who worked as a practical nurse. And Phil Graham struggled with an affliction, at that time nobody even knew what it was, didn't know how to diagnose it and didn't know how to treat it. He, he struggled with dyslexia. He had a, a serious learning disability. In elementary school, he was held back two grades. And his mother would walk him over into that area of Columbus, if you've been there where those big mansions are in Columbus. And she would walk him over there and hold his hand and she would say, now look at these houses, look at these mansions, watch the cars that drive in here. And she didn't say, these people have this because we don't have anything. They've taken food out of our mouths. She didn't create envy or strife or bitterness in Phil. She said, look at this, Phil. She said, if you will work, if you will overcome this situation in your life, if you will work, you can have this. She created instead of envy, she gave him a vision. 
And that vision of his mom who worked as a practical nurse, not even an RN, a practical nurse working in the homes of these kind of people, she created in that boy the sense that he could have this if he would diligently apply himself. When he would, a, a grade head, they say to him, Phil can't move on to the fifth grade. He's going to have to stay back. She said, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged with this, Phil. If you will work hard, it simply gives you the opportunity to understand the fifth grade better than anybody that moved on. She said, you're going to understand the fifth grade better than anybody that's ever lived because you will have done it twice. What a woman of vision. What a woman of character. And what she pounded into Senator Phil Graham was the value of work and the outcome of hard work. Work frees us from the sin of envy. I am doing what I can do as God gives me the opportunity and I'm honored to have the job. Now look at this. When the hobo on his way to the mythical mountains of Big Rock Candy says, I, I want to live in a place where they hung the jerk that invented work, where there's no shovels, where there's no picks, where there's no work. L listen to the, the slovenliness and the, and the self-indulgent. I want to live in a place where I never have to change my socks. Re really? <laughs> really? That's like a life vision, is it? Where you can sleep all day. Really? I want to live in a place where I can find the dignity of hard work, where I can do my job, do it to the best of my ability, provide for my family and contribute to the kingdom of God and take satisfaction in what I do. Look at the nature of God's work as it's revealed to us in the second chapter of Genesis. He saw the end from the beginning. He worked with a plan. He worked from a dream. God envisioned the entire universe before he ever said, let there be light. He made a plan and he followed the plan. He did the work well and he took personal satisfaction in it. At every day, he said, that's good. That's good. If you're mowing a lawn in the hot summer sun of Georgia and you get all finished before you load that lawn mower back on that trailer or move to the next lawn, stand on the edge of the lawn and look at it. Have you edged it well? Has it smooth? Have you done it right? Take some satisfaction. Say, now look at that. Look at that. This guy may live in a multi-million dollar house. He's too stupid and lazy to mow his own grass. But look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look at this. Take some satisfaction in it. I believe this is a blessed, work is a blessing from God. Then finally, he came to a place of rest. He came to a place where he rested. God worked and then rested. Now, I, I have a word for you. I believe in work. I believe in the satisfaction of it. I believe in the gratification of it. I believe in the productivity of it. But I also believe that there is an obsession with work. It is probably on this side of the scale that I've struggled the most, where I had the hardest time finding a way to bring myself to say, now work is finished. That's the end of work. I'm not going to sit at home with my wife and kids and need me talking on the cell phone, looking at my emails. I'm going to find a place where I close the door on work and I move into the place of rest, where I can rest my mind, rest my brain, rest my spirit, and rest my body. I believe in that. I believe in part of the spirit of rest is worship. I believe that on this day, we need to worship him. We need to rest from those things, to be recovered, to be renewed spiritually, intellectually, physically, emotionally, to rest with families, to rest in the arms of our loved ones, to rest in the arms of our God. I believe that rest is also part of work and learning to find that. Now, I, I want to pray this morning with you in a special way. I want to pray with those who are employers. On this Labor Day weekend, I want to ask you, challenge you with a very specific question. Do you treat your employees with the dignity that they deserve? Are you paying them as much as you possibly can? Are you exploiting their labors? Are you taking advantage of them? Are you finding a way to bless their lives? That you see your work as being extended, multiplied, magnified through their labor. 
I speak to the employers this morning. If the work is godly and work is, is a, a means of dignified gratification that people can feel satisfied about their work, do you praise your employees? Do you walk out to the work that they've done and say, I just want you to know how proud I am of you. I want you to know what a great job you're doing. I speak to the employers directly this morning. If labor is an honorable business, then do you honor laborers? Do you honor them? Do you show them love and affection and the care, the genuine care for their lives and their families? I want to pray this morning for those, all those who are employers, that God will prosper your business, that you'll be able to employ more people, that you will be able to bless your people as God has blessed you. If you're an employer in this house or at Gwinnett, I want you to stand right where you are. If you're an employer, and I want to pray that God will use you to bless labor. If you have even one employee, just stand right where you are. Will you do that? Good, good. Now I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you with the reality of to honor the labor of those who you employ. That you honor them as persons, that you treat them with dignity, and that if you ask them to be loyal to you, are you loyal to them? Are you building this up, them up? Are you edifying them? Do you honor labor? On this Labor Day weekend, say to yourself, I'm going to learn to honor my employees as they honor me. I'm going to teach them loyalty, faithfulness, and I'm going to teach them the dignity of what they do. I'm going to celebrate their accomplishments and not just simply exploit them as a means to make me wealthy and wise. Are you ready? If you want that prayer, you close your eyes. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for every employer here, those at Gwinnett County. I pray, God, that you will bless their businesses. I pray that you will prosper them, lift them up. God, I pray that where they've had uh, sales of 100, they'll have sales of 1,000. Where they've had sales of 1,000, they'll have sales of a million. Their productivity will go up, that the spirit in their company will be blessed. God, that their employees will know that they care for them and that they honor them. I pray that you will fill their mouth with good tidings. I pray that they will know how to reward their people and to bless their people and to care for them. Lord, that instead of being angry at their people, that they will know how to lead them to take satisfaction in the work that they do. Bless the employers here. Bless the employers in Gwinnett County, God. Bless their companies, their businesses that in every way the level of excellence will go up and that their companies will be blessed and that their people will rise up and call them blessed and say it's an honor to work for this company. I believe you for that in Jesus' name. Now, if you'll be seated right where you are. Now, if you are an employee, I just want to say something to you. Labor Day weekend is meaningful. It's important. It means the work that you do. If you're a school teacher, if you mow lawns, if you, if you lay bricks, whatever your work is, whatever the work that you do, it's honorable, it's dignified. Not only does America honor your work with this weekend, God honors your work and sanctifies your work with the fact that before one single human being ever worked, God worked. God worked with a plan. He worked with creativity. He used the powers that were within him to create something beautiful, and he took satisfaction in it. And that's what we offer for you today. If, you want to, if you're an employee and you would like me to pray that God will bless your work and take you further and higher than you've ever been, I want you to stand. If you're an employee, anywhere you work, just stand. Now I'm going to pray for you. Thank God. Thank God. I, I, I pray that your children and grandchildren will look at you and say, my daddy may not be a multimillionaire, but my daddy goes to work. My mom may not be the richest woman in the world. She may never be the president of the United States, but my mother has sacrificed. She's worked hard. She gets up every morning and does her job and comes home to me and provides for me. I, I pray that God will cause your children and grandchildren to take satisfaction in what you do and that, the, that your model of faithfulness and diligence at work will bear a great harvest in their lives. I'm believing for this with you. I'm going to pray for you now. If you will, just open yourself up to the blessing of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these. Lord, I'm not worthy to untie their shoelaces. 
But God, I know that they arise early and take care of their families and make lunches and get them off to school and then go to work and work hard all day and they have to come home, some of them and cook and some clean and some do laundry. It just seems like their work never ends. God, I pray that they will take satisfaction in their work. I pray that this for the secretary who types a letter that you look at it and then say, now look at that. That's a flawless letter. Not a single mistake, and I've corrected the spelling of my idiot boss, and it's looking good, and I'm going to send this letter out over his name, and I take satisfaction in what I've accomplished. Lord, I pray for, the, for the, those who do manual labor, that they will take satisfaction in the work that they do. I pray that you will give them favor with their employers and with others, and that you will bless the labor of their hands. God, I pray that they will be prospered, that you will lift them further and higher than they ever imagined. I pray for their children and their grandchildren, even to the fifth generation, that an, an inheritance, a heritage of work and dignity and, and honor and loyalty and character will flow down through the generations. I pray that you will free them from every financial bondage and from every financial sin and that you will lift them up and prosper them, place their feet in a broad place and anoint their head with oil. I thank you, God. I'm believing you for raises and for, for prosperity and blessing and for dignity and that they will have a financial plan for their lives and that they'll work the plan even as you, O oh Lord, worked the plan of creation itself. I thank you for them, God, and I honor them who labor for their living. In wonderful name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Those who are seated, will you applaud for those who labor for their living? Go on and applaud for them. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you. Now, will you stand right where you are all over the house? Now, listen to this. If you don't leave with anything else, will you leave with this? Work is not part of the curse. Work is a blessing from God, and God has modeled work himself. No job that you do or are called to do at any point in your life can be demeaning to you unless you allow it to be. You can take satisfaction in the least work, in the lowest kind of labor, and God will bless you in it and prosper you, and I believe him for it. Now look right up here and receive this benediction. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to give you rest in your souls and your minds, Unto him be all honor, glory, majesty, power, and authority, world without end, even this same God, our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you.